Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God, I mean, make us worthy, O Lord, say thank you, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We will look at it. It's, an, it's a, a liturgy that was done in Texas somewhere by a, a dear priest friend of mine. And uh, his co-serving priest, co-celebrant, two of them and the deacons, for the sole purpose of education, there was you will find no people in this liturgy. It's just a liturgy, a mass for instruction. So this part is starting from the creed, which I told you this is the beginning of the liturgy of the faithful. We start by reciting the creed, the Nicene Constantinople Creed. Remember when the church history, we had the second square, the Council of Nicaea. This creed was formulated then about who Jesus is. So the creed talks about the father and his son. And the Constantinople addition added the talk about the Holy Spirit and the church. So the deacon here is calling out to recite the creed. Everybody should be in the church. Whoever is in the church should loudly recite the creed. St. Paul especially emphasized this. He says, the mouth, the heart confesses, and the mouth confesses. The heart confesses for righteousness, and the mouth confesses for, for uh, what did he say? The heart confesses for uh, salvation, the mouth for righteousness. I'll bring that verse, but it has to be both, both heart and mouth. And that's very essential in the church that we actually loudly confess God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and confess the Son as the incarnate Logos, Jesus, the Son of St. Mary. Do you hear? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, truly. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Pantocrator, creator of heaven and earth, and all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not created, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and of the Virgin Mary, and became man. And he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead, according to the scriptures, ascended into the heavens, he sits at the right hand of his Father, and he is coming again in his glory, to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit. They make the prostration to the altar toward God, and then to the people, as priests being the, the mediators of the mystery, in between God and the people. We look for the resurrection of the... The last piece of the, of the, of the creed, the last sentence, is sung. Wait for the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. I mean... The priest uh, washes his hands and sprinkles so that to make sure that everybody see that he had washed his hands. Let us pray, bless, stand up for prayer, peace be. Whenever the priest starts the prayer, we'll make those two commands. Pray, he calls for prayer, and then peace. This is the reconciliation prayer written by St. Basil.
me stop here and tell you about this. This is the altar, the bread and the wine. The wine is on top of the throne, the big box, and the bread is in a pattern, in a plate. When they are covered, they're covered by two pieces of cloth, a bigger one, we call it the prosperine. In Greek means the, the cloth of the offering. And the little towel here, it's triangling, triangular shape. It's actually, uh, it's a square that is folded to, into a triangle. And these represents the two pieces of cloth that St. John described to us in the tomb of Christ. As if we are at the tomb where the body of Christ is laid and we cannot see him because it's covered. He's wrapped in a piece of white linen and his face is wrapped in a face towel. And you're gonna see the priest taking it and, and, and put it on his face as um, um, an, an acting of mimicking what Jesus' body was like. So the first piece of the, the liturgy of the faithful after the creed Reconciliation prayer is where we ask to reconcile with God and with each other. And we talk about uh, with a litany of peace. And death which entered into the world through the envy of the devil, you have destroyed by the life-given manifestation of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have filled the earth with the heavenly peace by which the host of angels glorify you, saying, Glory to God in the highest peace on earth and goodwill toward men. For perfect peace, love, and the holy apostolic greeting. Here is the first piece of this reconciliation prayer. It's a request for peace. We're asking for the peace of God. And uh, the sharing in the litanies, in all the church prayers, the part of the, the people, when they are actually taking on this prayer, although the priest is the one who's singing it or chanting it, the people take that into themselves by saying, Lord, have mercy. When they say, Lord, have mercy, it's a confirmation of whatever the priest is praying for, that we are with the priest. It's our voice. The priest carry our own petition. Lord, the next prayer is going to be the, to count, be counted worthy that Saint Justin Martyr talked about, to be counted worthy of the mystery. And you see here the priest carrying the corporal in front of his face as Jesus' face was covered with it. For us to see the face of Jesus, he has to rise. Cleanse us from all blemish, all guile, all hypocrisy, all craftiness, and the remembrance of vice bearing death. And make us all worthy, our master, to greet one another with a holy kiss, that without casting us into condemnation, we may partake of your immortal and heavenly gift in Christ Jesus. That's a special song. It doesn't have to be sung, really. But I want to take that time to talk, to tell you. So we're preparing for that. Uh, the first part is the prayer of worthiness. Uh, first part, prayer for peace of the reconciliation. The second part is a prayer for worthiness. Justin Martyr said we give a good prayer, asking God to count us worthy. And in it, the priest recites all the things that would not make us worthy. As we talked about it before from 1 Corinthians 11 and also from St. John, that it's the worst thing for people to be uh, come to communion and to come to kiss each other when they have grudges and hate, lust, uh, filthiness, foul language, etc. So there is a there is an importance here that we stop before we approach the bread and wine and start offering our offering as a church to ask for worthiness.
So this is the the piece. Here it is. The deacon is going to cry and say, greet one another. Here it is. That's the kiss. Greet one another with the holy kiss. Lord have mercy. As the deacon instructing people to greet one another with the holy kiss, like Justin Martyr has said, that after the prayer of worthiness, we greet one another with the holy kiss. During that, that the priest and the great deacon or the other priest would lift up the veil, which is like the shroud of Jesus, so that we can look at the body of Christ, the risen Lord. So this is a reminder or a symbol of I don't like symbol and a, and a meaning of symbol because symbols sometimes mean uh, something not real. No, it's here. It has a deeper reference. As, as they lift up the, the veil, the prosperine, we remember the resurrection of the Lord so that his body is now appearing to us like we read in the account of the resurrection. And the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and this marks the anaphora, the lifting up, the anaphora proper, the sacrifice of praise. So the priest here faces the people as Jesus faced his disciples and said, peace be to you. So the priest here says, the Lord be with you all, as we have the risen Lord amongst us in the church. The second command is to lift up the heart, as St. Paul says, if Jesus is risen, keep your thoughts and mind on things above. The third litany is to give thanks to the Lord. That's the core of what we do in the liturgy. It's what we call the liturgy of the Eucharist, Charistus, to give thanks. When we lift up our hearts to God, he finds thanksgiving. Then we go into the anaphora first part. This praise is taken literally from Revelation chapter 4, and it's focused on thanking God as a creator. By whom you have created all things visible and invisible, who is seated upon the throne of his glory, and who is worshipped by all the holy power. You who are seated stand before whom stand the <coughs> angels, the archangels. The principalities, the authorities, the thrones, the dominions, and the power. Look towards the east. You are he around whom stand the cherubim full of eyes and seraphim with six wings praising continuously without ceasing saying let us attend here I want to stop and just say we they just prayed the first piece of the anaphora proper which is the piece that thanks God for his creation who has created all things visible and the invisible who has created all things through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Then we go into the invisible realm. 
the angels, the archangels, the principalities, the dominions, the thrones. These are all listed in St. Paul letters as ranks of angels up in heaven. Why we recite them specifically out of all things? Because in the beginning we said who created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is there in the visible stuff. We go to the invisible because in the book of Revelation, we have the praise of the invisible, the beautiful, glorious, heavenly liturgy, which I would, I'm intending to share with you sometime today uh, from the book of Revelation. And ends up with the cherubim and the seraphim. And these are two special ranks of angels. And uh, the, the book of Revelation ends in, and Isaiah the prophet especially, speak about them vividly. And they're very uh, interesting beings. We'll talk about them when we come uh, to the Bible. But these are all very, very biblical passages uh, that actually describe to us God's worship in heaven. So we move from um, cre the creation that's visible to the creation that's invisible. And then we start uh, talking about their praise. So uh, when we move to that, the people response will be the, the praise of the cherubim. They call it the cherubimic hymn, the cherubimic song. And this is in all churches without exception, Catholic, Orthodox, Easter, Oriental, every single church has a cherubimic hymn, has our sharing with the heavenly and their praise. So this is what the people would be singing. Did I hear a question? Did I hear a question? I have one for you. Yes, go ahead. So is, are, are, what are they, are they, are the, uh, I'm going to mess up the nomenclature, but the priests you're, are, you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead. Kissing, what is it that they're kissing? It looks to it be in between when the one prayer ends, when another begins. Yes. They kiss the altar. Okay. Where the, that holy table where, where the offering is given. The altar is the most precious piece in the church. So that where at one point of the liturgy, the body and blood of Christ will be uh, visible to us. Also, uh, it is consecrated with the holy oil. So it's a very, very holy object. And that's why I, uh, I don't recommend putting anything on the altar. You know, I would criticize the, uh, the microphones being on the altar, the books even. That's not a place to put books or microphones or anything. Because what we have on the altar is the offering, what we offer. So we offer the body of Christ. At first, bread and wine. Then at one point, the bread and wine becomes the body and blood of Christ. Then incense. These are the things that we offer. We put candles, maybe. But the books are for reading. We, it's for us. So I think the deacons should carry them in their hands. The altar is not a, a shelf or a regular table. It's something that we offer on. Uh, so they kiss it. The priest kiss it out of reverence to uh, respect to this holy table. That's not like any other table. That's why we decorate it and we we put like golden stuff on it. And it's, it's really very, very special. This is the most holy object in the whole church. And it's kissed at the feet, if you think about it, of Jesus below or in front of the pattern where the uh, bread is. So is that done uh, when they feel when they feel led to do that, or is that a part of during this, uh, the prayer or in between prayers? Excellent question. So this done when they change places. So one priest goes, one priest comes. So whenever I approach the altar, I start by kissing it first out of reverence and respect. So I kiss it, then I start praying with it as giving attention to what I'm doing. It's almost like uh, an, an, a, a step to prepare me for what I'm going to do next. So they change places, they, the one who leaves kiss, and the one who comes kiss also. But sometimes we do it when we feel are led to do it, and during the prayer, when we are moved to kiss the table. Awesome. Thank you for clearing that up. You're welcome. The seraphim glorify you, proclaiming and saying, The sign of the cross and the bow is done by the people whenever they feel like doing, but there are certain places, especially when we say holy or mention the name of the Lord, we bow and make the sign of the cross as an act of worship.
the uh, next piece of the anaphora is the what we call it the argus. So the first piece praises God and thank him for his creative work. The second piece is going to praise him and thank him for salvation, for his saving actions. So the first part is about him as a creator. The second one is as savior. So the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Father in commissioning the Son to do his work, he had saved us as his people. Son coming and doing what he had done in the gospel and, and risen and ascending and sending the Holy Spirit, that's all actions of salvation. So that's the second part of the anaphora. So the anaphora has two pieces, creation, thanksgiving for creation and praise, then salvation, thanksgiving for salvation and praise. And here is the second part, starts with holy, holy, holy. Why it starts with holy, holy, holy? I think it is because holiness is demanding the commandments and the holiness. If we don't follow to be, it doesn't follow that we are not holy and we can be saved. To save us is to make us holy. That's basically what starts this second piece. Uh... Argios is Greek for holy. the priest and the people the word holy is repeated nine times which is a square three so three times to each of the, the persons of the trinity when we disobeyed your commandment by the deceit of the serpent we fell from eternal life and were the praise starts with a story of falling because to be saved, it means that to be redeemed, to be brought back. Us to the end, but have always visited us through your holy prophets. And in the last days, you manifested yourself to us who were sitting in darkness and the shadow of death. Through your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who of the Holy Spirit and of the Holy Virgin Mary. I want to stop here and say, the priest addresses the Father in this liturgy. He speaks to the Father. He said, you have not abandoned us to the end. When we fell disobeyed you and got kicked out of the garden and we couldn't we couldn't we could no more live with you you did not leave us you could have said they deserve it they had not left to me no you didn't abandon us but you send us the holy prophets but at the end of times you send us your only begotten son our lord god and savior jesus christ here is beautifully the liturgy introduces the story of salvation through the son very seamlessly there is no interruption so it speaks about the story of salvation from beginning to end. You created us, you put us in the garden, and then we fell through the, the, the deceit of the serpent. And then you did not leave us. And so you brought us, you, you sent us many prophets. But then in the last days, you sent us your only begotten son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he's, the priest here in the liturgy of St. Basil is going to recite the gospel, the summary of the gospel. And starting from the incarnation, from Jesus coming down to us through St. Mary and um, through the Holy Spirit and St. Mary. So this is how he's going to say it. So we're uh, at 40. I want to go a little bit before that so we can actually hear. 
Uh, hey, hey, Buna, I, I had a question about. Yeah, right, Go ahead, right. Tim. Yes, okay. please. Oh, sorry. Um, you, you said earlier that um that every church has a uh, a cherubic a cherubic uh hymn to it, right? I I meant here by different denomination the the different ethnic. It's, there's no denomination. So between the Roman Catholic, they have a cherubic hymn. The okay. uh, Greek Orthodox have a cherubic hymn. The Russian has a cherubic hymn. Usually the Byzantine, the Eastern churches has one uh, one song, but they have different melodies. We will learn there are six traditions. Each of them, of those six traditions, which includes Roman Catholic, Armenian, Byzantine, which Greeks and Greeks and Russian, uh, Coptic, Coptic, Ethiopian, Syriac, mm -hmm. East Syriac and, and West Syriac, and Indian. Uh, those those uh, liturgies or those traditions have their own uh, version of the cherubic hymn with different music and sometimes a little bit of difference of words, but the same meaning, the same heart. But the, everyone has that cherubic hymn. It's an essential part of the liturgy in all these six traditions, which you will find it all over the world. So the cherubic hymn is our participation with heaven. This is a song that's sung by cherubim and seraphim. Isaiah saw it in chapter 6. St. John in Revelation saw it in chapter 5. So we know um, in chapter 4 and 5, actually. 4 and 5. So we know that this song is not earthly song. It's, it's actually coming from heaven. And, and we sing it with them. We sing it with them. But it's not from one Coptic church to another or from one Greek to another. It's actually the, the six main ethnic uh, apostolic churches so the so you, you would say by alphabetical would be the armenian the byzantine the coptic the ethiopian the east syrian and west syrian the roman catholic so those are um, the six or the seven denominations that all have their own version of the cherubic hymn that's what i meant before we go on go ahead Hello. ask your question okay cool thank you you're welcome all right thank you for the questions that makes a lot of difference to me at least so i'm not i'm not swimming alone in the dark <laughs> okay all right not swimming alone in the dark oh, go ahead yes yes no, no, I said not swimming. okay Virgin so this piece is prophets. yeah and in the last days you manifested yourself to us who were sitting in darkness and the shadow of death through your only begotten son our lord god and savior jesus christ who of the holy spirit and of the holy virgin I'm going to stop here just say that this is how we introduce Christ into the prayer to the Father. We say, you say, we say that the priest says, you sent your son and he was incarnate, means became flesh through the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. You used this, the virgin, virginal womb through the work of the Holy Spirit on it to create the humanity of your son that he will be united with it. Now, um, and at this point, the priest puts incense. And I want to just, just you know, jump in and, and talk a bit about incense here. It is the incarnation of Christ in the mind of the church as if the, the, the belly of St. Mary was like that belly of the incense or the, the sense or the, the, the little um, uh, instrument that we use for, in, for incense. The belly of St. Mary is this silver or brass or gold even a bowl and inside of it there is coal fire hot red coal fire which is which is the divinity the divine so the incarnation of the lord became like incense that came out of the belly of saint mary giving good smelling aroma to the whole world so this is the beginning of it once we mention the incarnation the priest puts incense as the humanity of christ is being um, uh, conceived in the womb of, of St. Mary when we mention that. Of 
of salvation. He granted us the birth from on high through water and spirit. He made us unto himself an assembled people and sanctified us by your Holy Spirit. He loved his own who were in the world and as a ransom on our behalf gave himself up unto death which reigned over us whereby we were bound and sold on account of our sins. He descended through the cross. Here he comes through the story from the incarnation all the way to the cross and his death. And he descended into Hades. Now, every few sentences, the people will confirm. Amen. Amen. That's their share of in the liturgy. They are very much involved in it. And everyone is, is required to participate. This is our prayer, not just the priest. The priest is our um, uniting person, our uh, tongue, but he, we have to share in it, not just by heart, by actually saying it loudly, amen. And um, so we're going to go from this to the summit of our salvation. So we we'll go from the gift of the body and blood. That's what we will actually top this part of the anaphora with as we enter into the Last Supper and do what Jesus had done. Let's finish what the people are trying to say, and then we go into the next part. Sat at your right hand, O Father. He has appointed a day for recompense on which he will appear to judge the world in righteousness and give each one according to his deeds. According to As they say, uh, so the priest says, and, and he had appointed a day for recompense, the, day, the second coming of Jesus, who he will judge all humans or all the world in righteousness and give each one according to his deeds. So the people respond, according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our sins. During which the priest is actually taking from that incense. I'll tell you why he's doing that taking from the incense that he had already put when he mentioned the incarnation and took flesh. Very simply, because he's going to have his hands, the hands of the priest, act what Jesus had done. So what he's saying to himself and to others, I need to cover myself with the hands of Jesus. I need to have the hand of Jesus on top of my hands. Because this is a so lofty and high and holy thing that I am not as a priest worthy to be doing. So, um, and what the Catholics would say it in a different way, they would say the priest is acting in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. The priest becomes in place of Christ doing this, but the church actually emphasized that idea by giving the priest the incense of the incarnation, the flesh of Christ to cover his hands. So in his mind, by action, he's telling everyone and himself, my hands are not worthy. My hands are not pure. My, not, my hands are not holy. It is actually the hands of Christ that's going to perform this. And I am working with him. This, this is how he does it. As you go on and see the next step would be make, make it very clear. <laughs> That's why he points to the bread and wine, because now from, from the incense as the flesh to the bread and wine as the flesh of Christ. 
instituted for us this great mystery of godliness for being determined to give himself up to death for the life of the spot or blemish, blessed and life-giving. See, he says on his blessed, on his uh, holy hands, which are blessed and life-giving. So for that, he has to prepare by covering his hands with the hands of Christ in the, in the action of incensing his hands and linking them to the bread and wine. <clears throat> We believe that this is true. Amen. He started the first one of the six movements. He took bread, he looked up, he uh, he blessed, he he gave thanks. I'm sorry, he blessed, sanctified, he broke and give six acts or six actions that the church count for bread and also for wine so he started by he took bread and then the second one would be uh, he looked up toward heaven to you O god for his father and master of everyone. And when he had given thanks, Amen. he blessed it. So he starts with giving thanks because that's Eucharistos, the giving thanks. Again, the people was one step at a time with the priest, following with the responses. The priest has to, to divide the separating as Jesus did. broke. saintly disciples and holy apostles saying take eat of it all of you for this is my body which is broken for you and for many to be given for the remission of sins this do in remembrance of me. This is true. Amen. Likewise, also the cup after supper he mixed it with wine and water and when he had given thanks Amen. we call that part of the anaphora an institution because the priest does and say whatever jesus said and done word for word action for action
this is called the throne where the cup is. It's a hold. It's a holder. The cup. and gave it also to his own saintly disciples and holy apostles saying take drink of it he's acting out as if jesus is giving it to his disciples around the table forward backwards side and side which is shed for you and for many to be given for the remission of sins this do <coughs> and this is a biblical term for remembrance it's not just to remember someone who had died by a cup of wine or a dinner <coughs> this is a living memory something brought back to live and to experience anew for every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup you proclaim my death confess my resurrection and remember me till I come here the priest is actually moving from this the talk or the the way of talking in the third person to almost speaking in the first person we have done this earlier when he said he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave thanks and he blessed it and he sanctified it and gave it to his disciples and said take drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant for every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup we're moving toward that oneness the priest have with christ she so speaks almost in the first person, although if you follow it back, it becomes the third person converting to or moving on to the, to the first person. So that you would remember me till I come. And so that the priest in this moment completely disappears. And he does not speak of himself as a priest anymore, but speaks in that person of Christ with the tongue of Christ, saying to the people of the church, and this is my body. This is my blood. Whenever you eat of this and you drink of this, you will remember me. You will confess my, you will, um, you will remember my passion, confess my resurrection, and remember me till I come back. And the people will address Christ as through the whole liturgy. They've been addressing Christ through the whole liturgy. And they would sing this very special song at the top of the anaphora. Um, uh... Between the people and the priest, there is something we call an amnesis. An amnesis, Anna is a negative, not to. Amnesia is to forget. So an amnesis is not to forget or, to make it short, to remember. So the anamnesis of what? The anamnesis of what is so-called Pascal mystery. Pascal mystery. What's the Pascal mystery? It is like the... Passover, if you remember, Paschal lamb. Pascha means uh, Passover. So that God wanted them to live, the Jews, to live the, the exodus from Egypt every single year alive. 
with the lamb, with the matzo. It is not enough to tell, to tell the story or sing a song of their salvation, but they have to really engage in the same exact meal that they had done on their night of liberation. So, so likewise, our Paschal mystery is celebrated by the same meal that Jesus had done and on his night of passion, his night of exodus from our earth to heaven. So in uh, this Paschal mystery includes what actions, that salvific actions that Jesus had done. That includes his suffering, his death on the cross, his burial for three days, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to the heavens, and his second coming. These are the Paschal mystery, the works of the Lamb of God. So uh, what we call the anamnesis is to commemorate, to remember, to bring to memory, to bring alive, to bring now and here the actions of suffering, dying, burial, resurrection, and second coming. So that the priest is going to repeat that again. So that the people had done it and he's going to repeat it and he's going to repeat it in, in a kind of um, uh, adverbial way. So you're going to see it as we doing this. Therefore, as we also commemorate his holy wow. passion, his resurrection Two. from the dead, his ascension Three. into the heavens, his sitting at your right hand. O Father, and his Four. second coming <clears throat> from the heavens, awesome and full of glory, we offer unto you your gifts from what is yours for everything concerning every. So he says, offer to you. What we're offering right now is just bread and wine in the midst of the memory of his cross, death, resurrection, uh, burial, resurrection, ascension, sitting at the right side of the Father, second coming. We are actually offering bread and wine. And we are requesting the highest gift of all, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the priest is going to say inaudibly, as the people are singing, we praise you, we bless you. And this symphony of praise, the priest is actually, I, as the people are singing and praising God, the priest is saying inaudibly, that's what he's doing right now. We ask you, O Lord, we, your sinful, he speaks to the Father. We, your sinful servants, request or plead with you or pray that you send your Holy Spirit. He's, they ask, he's asking the Father to send the Holy Spirit. And if you notice his hands, and uh, so that, it, that he may come upon us, your servants. That means the priests and the deacons and the people, everybody in the church, the whole faithful. And upon these offerings, the bread and wine, to transform them and change them so that they become holies for your saints. So let me go back and show you what the priest is doing as he points to himself, including the deacons and the people. And then he points to the offerings of bread and wine. I'm repeating and replaying again. See, look at the priest and he's pointing to himself, himself and to the bread, to the wine. Asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is called epiclesis. What is epiclesis in all the liturgies, East and West? A request for the descent of the Holy Spirit. What we call our Sunday Pentecost. So the Pentecost of every Sunday. So when our uh, friends, the Pentecostal says, come, join us we have the holy spirit come i said i don't need to i have the holy spirit come down upon our request as a church every sunday now notice this prayer and he this bread he makes into his holy body he says and this bread he makes into his holy body so let's be careful here. So he first spoke to the Father and said, O oh, Holy Father, we, your servant, sinful servants, ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these 
oblations, the bread and wine, to transform them, to make them holy for your holies. And this bread, he, that third person is the Holy Spirit. So he's we're saying, oh, Father, send your Holy Spirit, that he, the Holy Spirit, may transform the bread into the body of Jesus, into his holy body. The Spirit didn't have a body. It is Christ. So here is the perfect work of the Holy Trinity. The Father sends the Spirit. The Spirit comes upon the bread to transform it into the body of Christ, like he had done in the womb of St. Mary in the beginning. Same thing for the blood. He's going to say the same thing. I So the precious blood of his new covenant. Again, I believe. Oh, oh, oh. It's given that he's also saying that the Holy Spirit, that the Father would, would send the Holy Spirit upon the wine to, to transform the wine into the blood of his new covenant. And his here belongs to Christ who made the new covenant with his disciples and the whole church. So this is the epiclesis, what we call epiclesis, a Greek word for the descent of the Holy Spirit. So this prayer comes after the anamnesis. And I have a common saying for me when I was studying this in the first, when I was a young priest, I said, there is no epiclesis without anamnesis, meaning you cannot ask for the Holy Spirit to come down without remembering Jesus and his salvific work, the Paschal Mystery. Whenever we remember the Paschal Mystery, we're ready to receive the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus was to ascend to the cross and die and get resurrected and ascend to heaven, there was no possibility for us to receive the Holy Spirit from God. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness, the spirit of adoption to be children, the spirit that cries in us, Abba Father, but he also the spirit responsible for the making of the body and blood of Christ in the womb of St. Mary. And he is the one responsible for making it in the church every Sunday. Notice during the epiclesis, everybody is bowing down and kneeling. It's such an awesome time. It's the height of the anaphora. It is actually the most holy part of the liturgy, if I can say that. If there is a degrees of holiness, this will be the summit. This is the place where we are actually all begging God with our hearts and mouths to send his Holy Spirit upon us, upon this oblations. Those who have readiness, they're ready, and their hearts are clean and ready. They have confessed their sins. They prepare themselves for this awesome moment. They will feel the shaking and the earthquake of Pentecost. Those who have not prepared themselves, this will be very um, usual and casual. Our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, given for the remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of Him. Now, this ends the what we call anaphora proper or the, the, the highest point of the liturgy. So we started with the, with the prayer of reconciliation. The first part is a litany of peace. The second part is a, a request for worthiness. Then we entered into the anaphora proper, started by the priest uh, uh, lifting up uh, the, the little uh, towel, the, the little corporal in front of his face. And we, uh, we remember the resurrection of Christ and we kiss each other. And then the priest enters into the anaphora by asking first, by telling everybody, the Lord is with you all, his face as uh, the people look at the face of the priest. They remember how the face of Christ was revealed to the apostles after the resurrection. And the priest says, the Lord be with you all, means Christ is in our midst, because we gathered here in his name. And then lift up your hearts, and uh, that literally means to look for heaven, to look for Christ on the right side of the Father, and then start thinking in the liturgy and forgetting about everything else that we should not be kind of confused, should have, should have cast away all the thoughts of the earth behind, all the things that we mundane things that we think about every day behind and then we start the two pieces of the anaphora the first one is praising god as a creator uh, that ends with the cherubimic hymn 
and then the, the second one which is praising god as a self as a, as a savior and we we uh, it's introduced in the beginning by introducing our sinfulness and how we fell and how god did not leave us and then eventually he, he sent his son and when we start talking about the incarnation the incense is put in the censer where the incense is sent and we remember the incarnation of christ as uh, the union of the divinity and and the humanity and how that made the whole universe smell much better and then not not physically of course but it's, it's a transformation of the whole creation by the incarnation of christ and then we move on into the institution where jesus has done his the gift of his body and blood we enter into it reverentially, reverently and then also uh with uh, participation almost on every move and we do it one for the bread and one for the wine the, the thanksgiving, the blessing, the sanctification, the breaking on, in the case of the, the body or the bread, and this, the tasting in the case of the wine. And then we end up with the anamnesis, that the amin, 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 your death, O Lord, we proclaim, your holy resurrection and ascension to the heavens, we confess. So this is the Pascal mystery in summary. And then the priest repeated again, as we commemorate his holy passion, his resurrection, passion and death of course his resurrection his ascension his sitting at your right hand of father his second coming from heaven that's what's called uh, the paschal mystery our passover from earth to heaven and as we do that we ask you to send your holy spirit we offer you we offer first we offer the bread and wine that have been prayed over that have been sanctified with prayer and we ask you to send the holy spirit upon us and upon these offerings to transform them to be holy things. And, and the priest would say, and this bread, he, the Holy Spirit that we ask you to send, will make it the body of Christ. And this wine will transform it, he, the Holy Spirit, transform it into the, the blood of the new covenant of Christ. And then that's, that ends. That's the highest point of the liturgy. That's the highest and the most holy peace. And that's why that the deacon cries out very loudly and says, kneel before god worship god in fear and trembling meaning pay the utmost respect and the utmost attention to this moment this is the moment of highest importance in the liturgy because through that we are given the holy spirit and we are given the body and blood of christ with the holy spirit and um, that's all what we want from this liturgy then after that the whatever whatever is left and we might need to talk, talk about it in another time Whatever is left until communion is litanies, litanies. All the rest is requests from God. And the church does that based on the idea that if we have the body of Christ and if we have the Holy Spirit, we are in a much better place to ask whatever we want from God and it will be given to us. So we go on and, and have that boldness to ask different things and we call them litanies, means requests, petitions. We can say petitions. And next time we're going to go through them quickly and maybe next time also i'll give you the one piece from the book of revelation to show the the intense biblical references in this worship piece it's really very very rich every single letter in this prayer and every single move is from somewhere in the bible that you would omit and ignore and and go over without even noticing it but it's so precious like jewels that the church had picked, put them together to make this most exquisite piece of jewelry. That is the liturgy. Uh, so let's say our Father. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, thine is the kingdom, power, and glory now and forever. May the love of God the Father and grace his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you.